It was considered a good job because it had a steady wage. It had uh, a pension, even then. Today, still, that's one of the reasons it's a very sought after job. Um, there was some debate about whether or not they had to be citizens. And Waring was very distressed when some legislators came to him and said, you can only hire citizens because it's recently arrived Italians, according to Waring, seemed to have a knack for the work. And they were strong and they would sort of put their heads down and do what had to be done. And uh, so what? They didn't speak English. So what? They weren't citizens. But it was, um, it was in terms of who did it, they, any able-bodied man who was willing to be out there and, and hold down the hours and, and pick up the weight was eligible for the job. The, he also got in trouble when he kicked out a lot of Civil War veterans because uh, veterans credits, not, not completely different from what's the credits given today in civil service employment, but back then if you were a civil service, I'm sorry, a Civil War veteran, it was understood that you had the right to certain kinds of jobs and he found them to be among the most deadbeat of the Department of Street Cleaning employees, and so he fired them. And it was a great hue and cry. He himself was a Civil War veteran, and he's firing his own, and this, this can't be done. And, but he, he held steady, and he said, look, if you can do the work, you can have the job. If you can't do the work, you can't have the job. Radical for the day, absolutely radical. Piece at a time. The sewer system of the city was put in place. Um, there was, it was never built as one system imposed for the entire city. It was neighborhood by neighborhood. In fact, the North River Sewers Treatment Plant that is today at 145th Street and Riverside Drive was brought online in the late 1980s. 1980s. And until then, all the sewage from the west side of Manhattan went straight into the Hudson River. So it, it's been piecemeal. In fact, I was, Joel took me to the top floors to look at the view. And when you look across the East River, you see the eggs, these egg-shaped structures. That's the largest sewage treatment plant in the world. It's not done yet. It's New York City Department of Environmental Protection. So it's sort of, it's still being built in a way. And we have what's called the combined sewage overflow system, meaning one set of pipes so when it rains, all the rainwater goes into the same pipes that are dedicated to sewage, and it's usually, it, in a bad storm, it will overwhelm the system, which dumps the raw sewage straight back out into the rivers, which is, uh, the whole system should be a dual pipe system, but imagine the cost of rebuilding that here. Waring invented a dual pipe system that he built in Memphis. He had a very colorful life, um, but I would say, stand up here another 20 minutes telling you all that, and I, I will resist. No, it's not still the worst. Some neighborhoods are considered as good as it gets, pristine. Some neighborhoods are considered in need of a lot more uh, help. Um, and you can, I'm sure from your own experience in the city, if you spend any time here, you can, dis, you can sort of figure out which ones those are. Manhattan 3, that's the lower part of the island. Manhattan 3 is the sanitation district that is in charge of Chinatown. Manhattan 3 is a constant battle. It's a mess down there. Is it because the garage is badly run? Is it because of the people who live in Manhattan 3? Is it because of uh, tourists passing through and littering? Is it, what are the factors that govern the problems in Manhattan 3? I live in Manhattan 9, which is on the upper, it's in uh, West Harlem. On the west side of Manhattan 9, it's a mess. The middle of Manhattan 9, the east side, it's not so bad. Why? I, I know the guys out of these garages, and they're the same as they are in any other garage in the city. Some of them are absolute, they work very hard, and others they don't work quite as hard as they might, but there, there's nothing um, remarkable about the workforce in one garage versus another that would dictate that one neighborhood is not as well kept as another. You know, income can, income, I haven't, I haven't run any numbers, but um, more affluent neighborhoods tend to be cleaner. Is that because of the populace or because of the, the business improvement district jurisdiction where 
They'll hire private street sweepers, just like they used to back in the day. The balance between private and municipal employee is still a little bit. We have municipal employees for household collection. Giuliani proposed privatizing that back in the early 90s. Uh, if he did, it would just flip, it would flip it back it was private off and on throughout the city's history, and then it was public off and on. I'm not sure one system is better than the other. Uh, whoever's going to do the work most efficiently is probably the, the, the one to choose. But then you step into the historical debates about union labor and who's, is there, is there a justice issue here about who should have the right to do the work and earn a living wage? And benefits for sanitation workers are not the same as for police or fire. Um, they're not as good in many ways. Death benefits are not as uh, generous. Um, although you're three times more likely as a sanitation worker to be injured or killed in the line of duty than you are as a police or a firefighter, which is uh, a very surprising statistic that most people don't know. That's according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. But I've taken your question and I've run way off in the tangential direction. Sorry. When Brooklyn and Queens became part of the larger city. Well, because they were their own, Brooklyn was its own city, and Queens was its own collection of smaller municipalities. Each had its own mechanisms for dealing with household garbage and, and various forms of waste, with, at least in the case of Brooklyn, similar patterns of profound corruption at every level. And when Brook when the consolidation happened and the city became the five boroughs, slowly over a few years, the jurisdiction of organizations like the Department of Street Cleaning were extended into what we call the outer boroughs. Um, outer is a little prejudicial, but outside of Manhattan, um, but with similar, similar kinds of problems. Staten Island was seen as a, a happy place to put uh, all kinds of waste that the city didn't want to put in crowded, more crowded boroughs. So even from the early part of the 20th century, Staten Islanders were saying, do not bring us all your garbage. And the city government was saying, eh, too bad. Not enough people living there for us to really worry about you, so we're going to take all our garbage over there. And of course, the uh, most dramatic example of that was the Fresh Kills Landfill. Opened in 1948, Robert Moses swore three years only. 51 years later, it was closed by Giuliani, that's a whole other story. So it, it, it grew outward slowly over time. Do not follow the model of the United States. Do not follow the model of New York. Figure out ways to, to, to manufacture products that can then cycle back through. Uh, put in place a very rigorous EPR, Extended Producer Responsibility, set of laws that if you have a car or if you have a, uh, the TV dinner tray that is left over after you eat anything from the big ticket items to the smallest consumer product, it can go back to the manufacturer at no cost to the consumer and that can create incentives for the manufacturer to not generate, not create products that can only become waste. That's, and certainly don't get in your car. And that's, I mean, the, it's a whole other, um, use of fossil fuels is a. I've talked today mostly about um, city garbage and municipal waste, but of course there are many, many, many other categories of garbage and waste. Um, and it, a distressing statistic is that if you take all the municipal household waste from the country, and let's say every citizen of the United States becomes a perfect recycler, and we divert the diversion rate is 100%. We do not throw out anything else, anything from our own homes. We will have reduced the nationwide waste stream by about 3%. One of the most startling and to me most important questions about garbage today is to look at that little fact and open up the question, why are we not focusing real energy on other forms of manufacture, of industry, of pollution that generate vast quantities of waste. I can 
be 100% meticulous with every water bottle I ever encounter. I can stop using plastic bottles. I can, stop, I can become 100% diverted in my garbage practices, but I'm not necessarily going to have any kind of dent. I'm not saving the planet. When you use the cloth bag instead of the plastic bag, you're not saving the planet. It's an important step, but there's so much more. So why aren't we as a nation asking hard questions about these other categories? And, and I don't mean to get up on a political high horse here, um, but I worry that we think we're doing the right thing. We want to do the right thing. There's an immense will to change our behavior. And at the same time, are we being hoodwinked? That's enough. It's not enough. 